Entry and exit chimes are off. Okay, there you go. Apparently I didn't do it right the first time. All right, well, thank you everyone for being with us. Um, this, this is kind of part two uh, of our annual review of going back to the basics. And what we mean by that is our willingness to begin with a beginner's mind, a Zen mind, an empty mind, <clears throat> to, to take everything that we ever knew or thought we knew or believed even, even the things that we believe and we are not yet aware of the fact that we believe them. Right? They're, they're down somewhere in our subliminal part of our mind or our subconscious part of our mind, wherever you want to call it. We are willing to take all of that and just toss it aside and start all over again and ask ourselves, what do I know? How do I know it? What do I believe? Why do I believe it? Is there another possibility? Is there another way of thinking? Is there another way of being? Is there another way of believing? And the importance of this, the reason that it is so important, is our, our fundamental premise, our starting point, right? the, the handle that we have, if you, if you want to call it that. Right? This, this thing itself, Dr. Holmes uses the term thing in order to in order to get us to to go outside our box because if we use the word god everybody everybody says oh yes i know exactly what that is and in truth no one knows exactly what that is because it is ineffable it is beyond our understanding so by using the word the thing by using the term the thing it's kind of causes us to say well what are we talking about here we have to go back and re-examine. We have to go back and, and rediscover, right? re-explore, <laughs> begin the adventure again. And the reason it's so important is the starting point of our exploration into this thing and our relationship to this thing is the idea that we live in a spiritual universe in which it is done unto us according to our belief. Now, if that premise is true, and you have to find out for yourself whether or not it's true, you can't just say, oh, Jim told me, so it must be so. Right? You have to find out for yourself. You have to, you have to experiment. Right? This is why Dr. Holmes called us scientists. Right? We must experiment. If there is a power in the universe that responds to us according to our belief, how would we know that? How would you experiment with that? What is belief, you see? And how do we go about changing belief? And what is the relationship of faith to belief? And is faith an intellectual understanding, a concept that we grasp and we, we give our assent to, we agree with it? Oh, yes, well, that makes sense. I believe that. Or is it more, see? Is it more? We start to get down into some of the really deep, deep issues of going back to, as I said last week, zero-based budgeting. Going back to the beginning and saying, well, why do I believe that? Why is that so? If it is true that we live in a universe in which it is done unto us according to our belief, how would I know? How would I go about testing that? How would I go about changing that, changing my belief? Or can I observe, you see? Yeah, think of any, any premise that, that we studied as kids in science, you know. And, and how did we learn? You know, so, so first off, somebody gave us a concept. Somebody told, gave us an idea. And then perhaps they looked around and gave us examples in nature, in life, of where this, this concept could be seen in action. And then maybe they gave us, for those of us who were fortunate enough to go to a school that had a budget, which I wasn't in that, till late in high school, they might have given us some way of experimenting. So, for example, you know, um, electricity. We might, we might study a little bit about the pioneers who, 
who experimented with electricity and developed these ideas and these theories about what electricity was and how electricity works. And we might be given examples, well, you've all used a flashlight, you know, you put a battery in and the battery is a storage device. It stores this thing, this magical thing called electricity, and this battery stores it. And you put it in and it's got a little thing called the bulb, and the bulb has this thing called a filament. And then you've got a switch and you push that switch, and the electricity flows from one end of the battery to the other, passing through the filament, heating it up to the point where it glows, and then you get light. You say, oh, okay, yeah, so I understand that. And little, little kids love playing with flashlights, you know. I love going to the, uh, the hardware store where they have those little tiny, tiny flashlights for a couple bucks, and just, just buy those and put them in the kids' Christmas stockings when they're little. They love experimenting with the flashlights. They love shining that light. And we say, well, electricity does other things, too. You know, it, it comes into your home and it lights the lights, that's for sure, you know. But how does it get here? You know, how does the electricity get here? We say, oh, well, you see those big wires strung along the road. They carry electricity from the generating plant. Well, here, where we live, <clears throat> there's a nuclear plant probably less than six miles from, from the house, you know. We can go out, <laughs> most days I can go out and just turn in that direction and see the, the plume of steam coming out of it. But somehow, magically, somehow, <laughs> somehow, that steam is used to create electricity, and that electricity flows through the wires, and it flows not only to my house, but it flows to every house and every business. It flows to all of them. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't say, well, you know, I'm going to go to Jim's house because I like him, but I'm not going to go to the neighbor's house because they're not such good people. Not at all. Anybody who makes their connection to that power grid, anybody who cooperates with power the way that it works, anybody who, who has the electrician come in and, and hook up the wires, anybody can use that electricity. And the electricity comes into the home, and it does many things. It does many things. It not only lights the light, if you have an electric stove, it cooks your food. You know. If you have an air conditioner, it cools the air in your house. If you have a heat pump, it warms the air in your house. If you have an electric furnace, it warms the air in your house. Think about all the things that we use electricity for. So now we have this fundamental concept of what electricity is by playing with a, a, a flashlight battery. And we have all of these different things that we are told, well, these are also demonstrations of the laws of electricity. And we can say, okay, well, I, you know, he gave me the concept. You, you, you let me play with the flashlight. You've given me other evidence, you know. Uh, maybe you've showed me pictures of the, of the generating station at Niagara Falls, you know, how water kind of tumbles down over the turbines. I'm starting to get this, this idea, this belief, you know, yeah, there, there is something called electricity. There, there is. I, I, I kind of accept that. Now, I can go absolutely no further. Absolutely no further with my inquiry into electricity. All I have to know is, is if I turn that switch, the light comes on. If I turn it again, the light goes off. That's all. That's all I need to know. But if I want to know more, if I want to know more about electricity, then I've got to ask myself, well, how would I know that? See, how would I know that? I can read books, you know. I can, I can read theories. I can study. Um, I can get a, a scientific calculator to help me make calculations about the way electricity electricity should work in a given circuit. I can do all of those things. But at some point, I'm going to have to experiment. So maybe I go to, <laughs> maybe I go to. Um, one of those shops that sells science experiments for kids. You know, they used to have them at, at the, the malls. I don't, I don't know if they're there anymore. One of the online retailers uh, used to love their catalog when it came. Edmund Scientific Company. So all kinds of all kinds of gadgets and experiments. But we can buy a little kit, you know, and we can we can then play. We can have batteries, and we can have lights, and we can have we can have little fans. And we can have resistors, and we can have capacitors, and we can read this theory, you know. And the theory says, well, 
you know, the, the current flow in the circuit is, is kind of dependent upon how much resistance there is and how much voltage there is. We say, oh, okay. We can play with that. We can get a meter. We can measure resistance. We can measure voltage. We can do all the calculations. And then finally we can see, ah, yes, <clears throat> the electricity in the circuit seems to be working the way I was told, the way that I was taught. I can measure the resistance. I can measure the voltage across the resistance, and it agrees with the calculation. So now we have like a deeper understanding from experimenting. We, we have a, a, a deeper grasp of it, you know. So now if I ask you, is there something called electricity, you would say, of course. And I would say, well, how do you know that? Now, before you did your experiments, you might say, well, you know, I was told that. I was told that. But now you would say, well, not only was I told that, but I did some investigation on my own. I went, I went down to Radio Shack and I got a meter and I got resistors and I got capacitors and I built little circuits and I, I took some instruction and I read a book and, and I convinced myself that electricity is there. And we say, okay, very good. Now, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with it? And you say, nothing. I just, I've satisfied my curiosity. I just... Uh, I wanted to convince myself that there really was this thing called electricity, and I'm satisfied. I'm not going to do anything else because really, you know, the house has been wired by the electrician, the lights work, everything works. There's no need for me to do anything else. Or you might say, wow, now I have at my disposal because of my knowledge, because of my experimenting, because I have satisfied myself that it works, right? the light comes on, but now I know the way in which it works. And if I cooperate with the way in which it works, I can use it to do anything I want, anything I want. If, if I put my mind to it, if I think about it, if I do some research, I can use it to do anything I want. You know? I mean, think of, think of, um, the first person who invented air conditioning. We could take the heat from the, from the coal in the power plant and we can turn it into cool air in your house. You know? And if you just put it that way, somebody would say, well, you're nuts, you're nuts. You can't take that which is hot and use it to produce that which is cool. Nevertheless, it does, nevertheless, it does. Somebody had an intention. Somebody had an intention to do that. And they were able to cooperate with the laws of electricity, the way the laws of electricity work. And they were able to produce that result. Now, staying with this example of electricity, right, as the force, as the power, as, as the doer of the work, if you want to think of it that way, the electricity doesn't care. You can say, well, in the summertime, electricity produces cold air that blows into my house. And in the wintertime, electricity produces hot air that blows into my house. It doesn't make a bit of difference to the electricity. The electricity is operating as a blind force flowing through the circuits according to its own nature according to the laws that govern its operation. What makes the difference of whether the electricity produces hot air or cold air is intention. Intention. The intention of the inventor, the intention of the manufacturer who beat who built your heating and air conditioning system. And your intention, when you go and you set the thermostat. <clears throat> now this house we have here uh, does not have an auto changeover thermostat. An auto changeover thermostat is one that will automatically switch between heat and cool. I have to go over and actually throw the switch from heat to cool. I have to have the intention, you know. 
So certain times of the year, it's hot during the day and we have to run the air conditioner, but at night it gets cool and then we have to turn the heat on. So we have to remember before we go to bed, switch it over to heat. We have to have that intention. But the laws of electricity don't change what we're doing, right? So electricity does not shout out, as I walk down the hall and pass the thermostat, electricity does not shout out, Jim, Jim, it's going to get cold tonight. You need to switch it over to heat. The laws of electricity will only do what, it, <coughs> what they are directed to do according to our intention. I have a dimmer switch in the dining room. You've all seen dimmer switches. You turn the knob one way and the light gets brighter. You turn the knob the other way and the light gets dimmer. That's why it's called a dimmer switch. It could be called a brighter switch, but it's called a dimmer switch. Now, the electricity does not know and does not care whether that light is bright or dim. The electricity does not know or care. But you have made a decision. I have made a decision. I have turned that dimmer switch and the laws of electricity have responded accordingly. Now we could say, well, <laughs> electricity produces light or it produces dark. If I've got the dimmer switch all the way down. But that's not entirely true, you see. It does not produce dark. It has simply been cut off. The switch is cut off. And darkness is a condition that only exists when somehow the light is blocked. When it is nighttime, we are in the dark because we are in the, in the shadow of the earth. We are on the dark side of the earth. The other side of the earth is facing the sun and we are in the shadow. So the darkness is a real experience to us. If you go out in the dark and your eyes aren't adjusted, you might trip, you might fall down, you might stub your toe. That's a real experience and it's a painful experience and it hurt. But we can't say, well, the sun did that to us because it wasn't shining. Or if we get up in the middle of the night and walk through the house without turning on the light and we stub our toe, we can't say, well, the electricity d did that to me, you see? The electricity caused me to do that because it did not shine the light. Electricity doesn't know. Electricity doesn't care. Electricity doesn't have that, that will and volition, you see. It just wasn't turned on. It just wasn't engaged. We brought that suffering of the stub toe to ourselves by not properly using the power that was ready, willing, and able to work for us. All we had to do is turn on that light. That's all we had to do. <laughs> Yeah. And we do it so often that we, we just forget that we're doing it. And we, we remember that at those times when the power goes out. You know, you have a storm in the winter and the power's off for an hour or two. How many times do you go, you go someplace and turn the light switch on, expecting the light to come on, knowing full well that the electricity is turned off? You know? I used to chuckle because when the power finally came back on, <clears throat> every light in the house was turned on. Every switch in the house was turned on. People had gone into every room one at a time and turned the light switch up and said, oh, the electricity is off. The electricity is off. So we use that power. We use that law. But we are using it typically without choosing consciously. It just becomes second nature to us. It just becomes routine to us. We are not mindful of what we are doing. We do it. It is appropriate, usually, right? We need the light on, just turn the light on. You know, <laughs> you know, it just comes on. But we're not thinking about it. We're not paying attention. See? The other thing is we're not superstitious about it. See? We, we don't go over to the light switch and we don't light a candle. We don't light a stick of incense. We don't, we don't chant to it. We don't 
scrunch up our eyes and say, I command thee, light switch, to turn on the lights. We simply comply with the way that electricity works. We have an intention. We wish to turn the light on. We wish to have the light come on. That's our intention. And we flip that switch. So we, we are going back to the basics. Every January we go back to, to remind ourselves of some fundamental things and then to ask ourselves, are we paying attention? See, are, we, are we paying attention to what we're paying attention to? Dr. Holmes said that this teaching is for people who like to think about what they're thinking about. Now, if we wish to go through life with this tremendous power that we can use to, to do things without paying attention, that's our choice. See, that is up to us. That is our choice. Now, many times we, we don't even make it consciously. See, we are, we are in the process of awakening. So the fundamental idea that we want to grasp, that we want to hold on to, is this claim that there's a power in the universe that responds to us according to our belief. And the second thing we want to ask ourselves is, well, how would I know that that's true? Because if it is, and I have all sorts of possibilities, then it would seem reasonable that I would want to cooperate with it. You know? <laughs> it it would seem reasonable if you're, if you're out in the backyard and you've got a big galvanized tub and you've got a washboard in it and you put soap and, and water in there. You heat the water up on your fire and you're just scrubbing your clothes on the washboard and somebody comes along and says to you, you know, with electricity they've got machines that'll do that for you. You would probably say, <laughs> how can I get one of those? You know, Sign me up. We wouldn't say, no, this is okay. I'm, I'm, just going to keep, I'm just going to keep doing it the old-fashioned way. So if this premise is correct, if it is true, there is a power in, in the universe that responds to us exactly according to our belief. That's kind of like the handle. You remember, you remember the parable of the, of the four men who, who didn't see, and they each had a different part of the elephant. And they each thought the elephant was something different. Some thought it was a wall, some thought it was a tree trunk, some thought it was a rope, some thought it was a snake. See, they each had a handle, they each had an entry point or a starting point. And their concept of the elephant was based on their experience of the elephant, which was limited because they couldn't see. And for them, the elephant might as well have been a wall or a tree or a rope or a snake because they couldn't see the whole picture. But they had to have a starting place. Each and every one of us has to have a starting place. We have to, be, we have to begin somewhere. We have to begin. But we can be willing to understand that even though this, this entry point that we offer, the, the entry point to this teaching, it is done unto you according to your belief, that it is going to lead us into a greater discovery. It is going to lead us into a greater experience of what this thing called God is. See, it's one thing to say that there's a power of electricity and we can use it and we turn on the light switch and it works. It's another to say, wow, I can study about electricity and I can learn about electricity and I can experiment with electricity. But it's still another to say, well, what is electricity? What is electricity? Where did it come from? Why is it here? <laughs> you know? What is its importance? You say, well, it's just here. It's just, it's just, it's, it just is. Right? Electricity just is. And we come to start to realize, well, well wait a second. You see, electricity is just a form of energy. But what is energy? And where did energy come from? And where does energy go? And we start to learn in in the laws of, of conservation of energy when we study physics, that energy can't be created and it can't be destroyed. It can only be changed. It can only change form. What a magnificent universe this is. It has all this energy, all this energy. 
but it can't be created. It can't be destroyed. It just is. <clears throat> so in the example of the nuclear plant, the energy from the decay of, of, of the nuclear material produces heat. That heat produces steam. That steam turns the turbines. And that produces electricity. But the, but the turbines are spinning within a magnetic field. Somehow the wire spinning within the magnets causes electricity to flow. How does the magnetism become electricity? Is that what's really happening? Do the magnets ever wear it out? We start to get into this deeper wondering. You see this deeper, this deeper exploration. If, if we let our minds go, if we let our minds follow back, if we are curious, right? Curiosity, we talked about that last week. Curiosity, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? We come back, if we follow the energy, we come back to this idea that energy just is. We can take the heat of the coal and we can turn it into, <laughs> we can turn it into the, to the cold air that comes out of our air conditioner. Isn't that amazing? See? Isn't that wonderful? And we, we tend not to think about that <laughs> unless it's not working, you know. Turn the switch, the air conditioner comes on, we're happy, you know. We never stop to consider the miracle, or the seeming miracle, by which the heat in the electric plant becomes the cold air in our homes. If we take this entry point then into, into our spiritual growth, the entry point being we live in a spiritual universe, and the activity of spirit is thought, which is a movement within consciousness, and that somehow, some way, there is a power in the universe that responds to us according to our belief. If we take that as an entry point and say, how would I know that? What other people have, what has, what, excuse me, what have other people said about that? How can I experiment with that for myself? How can I test that for myself? What is this thing called belief? How would I go about changing beliefs? How did I even get my beliefs? You see, we start to get into it deeper and deeper and deeper inquiry into the very nature of reality. And then our concept of God, our experience of the divine increases, like the blind man who might start out holding the leg of the elephant, but then reaches up and touches the side and says, oh, says the other one, I understand what you're saying, it is like a wall. Let me come around to where you are, my friend, in, in the front, where you have, <coughs> where you have the trunk and you say, it's, it's like a snake. Let me, oh yes, it is like a snake. And let me go around to the back. You, my friend, you have the tail. And you say, it's like a rope. Yes, yes, I understand why you would say it's like a rope. But it must be more, you see. It must be more than all of this put together. Our spiritual growth, our, our journey, we talked about last week, embarking upon the journey is that we are constantly expanding, constantly expanding. Not only our ideas, but our actual experience of the presence of the divine. Excuse me, will I get a drink here? So last week after the talk, I sent out an email with um, a bunch of resources in it. And I hope everyone got that. If you didn't, uh, you can go look for the Facebook page. Ideas Worth Sharing One is the Facebook page. And the link to the email I sent out last week, the link to every email I send out is on that page. And you can, you can open that email and you can go to the download links and you can, you can actually... Um, take those resources that are identified, you can put them in a folder on your computer. There's enough information in, in that email, <clears throat> there are enough resources in that email that if you downloaded them and you started earnestly studying them today, and you lived for another hundred years, you would not finish what is contained in that one email. That's how rich those resources are. But one of those resources was Thomas Troart's The Creative Process in the Individual. And as I mentioned last week, Dr. Holmes 
kind of took took that that information and restated it, summarized it, and added his own ideas to it, and that became the first four chapters, or the four chapters that are the introduction to the Science of Mind textbook. And he started out, and he says, well, what is this thing? What is this thing itself? What is this thing that we call God? And then the second one, which is about where we are today, remember I said we're gonna, we're gonna drift back and forth between the four for the month, is the way it works, the way it works. So he starts off with this, this, this concept of the thing as being all, as being unity, as being oneness, as being singularity. Right? He starts the textbook off, the very first paragraph says, we all look forward to the day when religion and science will walk hand in hand from the visible to the invisible walking hand in hand. He has no argument with science. He doesn't say, well, science is wrong because science doesn't agree with, with my understanding of scripture. Doesn't, doesn't go into any of that. Remember, no superstition, no fear, no superstition. We don't go to the electric switch and we're not afraid that we have to somehow coerce or convince or beg or plead to get that, to get that switch to do what it's supposed to do, to do what it naturally does. And we should approach this understanding or this inquiry into the divine <clears throat> the same way, without fear, without superstition. Now this is, um, this is kind of something that for some of us may be difficult because we, we grew up in an environment where, remember last week I said we, we were given lots of ideas, we were given lots of concepts, and we accepted those as our own. But now, now we're grown up. Now we're grown up. Now we have to take responsibility for that which we allow ourselves to believe. And the reason we have to take responsibility is we have the accountability. In other words, if we live in a universe in which it is done unto us according to our belief, then we are the one who get to experience the consequences. Whether they be positive or negative, we are experiencing the consequences or the outpicturing of our beliefs. Now for some that's difficult because Remember when I said if the dimmer switch is turned down, it's dark, but the, dimmer, the electricity didn't create the dark. The darkness is a temporary condition that exists because the light has been blocked. So when we say that we are experiencing the outpicturing of the consequences of our belief, sometimes people will say, well, I, I wasn't, I didn't do anything to consciously believe in arthritis, and yet here, here I am, I have arthritis. So what's going on here? Well, the freedom of movement is blocked somehow. God didn't send you arthritis. You aren't thinking about the arthritis. Arthritis is, is the darkness, if you will, that can only exist because the light is blocked. Now, you didn't do that deliberately. You didn't choose to do that deliberately. You didn't say, gee, I wish to have that. But somewhere, somewhere in that part of our, of our consciousness, the subliminal part, the part that we're not exactly uh, familiar with what it's thinking, something in there provided the mental equivalent of that. Now, I gave an example uh, before. I'll give it again. It was a, a book that I read many, many years ago when our first child was, uh, was being born. So that's like 50 years ago. The, uh, the doctor used hypnosis as anesthesia, and, we, and Lori and I became aware of it because he was, he was using that to prepare her for delivery. And I got this little book um, on self-hypnosis. If you want to get it, uh, Leslie M. LeCron, L-E-C-R-O-N, was the author, and the title was, I believe the title was just self-hypnosis. But he gave the example in there of, um, of a man who, <laughs> whose sister-in-law moved to town and moved within walking distance. And his wife decided that on every Sunday afternoon they were gonna, they were gonna walk over to the sister-in-law's house and they were gonna have dinner at the sister-in-law. So he didn't wanna go. <laughs> For whatever reason, he didn't wanna go. You know, maybe he didn't like sister-in-law, maybe he wants, wanted to watch football, who knows. But he didn't wanna go. And he resented that, see. He resented having to go there. And over time what happened was he developed arthritis and he couldn't walk, so he couldn't go. 
And when he finally went and, and sought help for the arthritis and, and the doctors realized that it was, it was not just a medical condition, that there was something causing it, and he went to see the psychologist who used hypnosis. They found out that what was happening was his intention <laughs> or his desire of not walking to the sister-in-law's house had manifested itself in a condition that prevented him from walking. So you can say, well, he wasn't thinking about arthritis. He didn't wish arthritis on himself. No, no, no. He blocked the freedom of movement by his belief, by his attitude, by his feeling nature, you see. So I just toss it out because sometimes that's a, that's a tough point for people. This gets down to what the theologians call the problem of evil. If God is so good, why is there disease? Why is there suffering? Why is there disastrous? Why are all these things, you know? And as I said last week, it's one thing to say God is presence. God is all presence. God is present everywhere. It's one thing to say that, and as Joel Goldsmith tells us, it's another thing to realize it. And what we can do is, is we can look and we can say, in these parts of our lives where we are exper having experiences that are less than perfect, whole, and complete, we can say, well, for some reason, for some unknown reason, we just simply have not realized the presence of God yet. We haven't turned the switch on, all right? That's all. So we just want to keep it there. We want to keep it at the level of, <laughs> if there's a power in the universe that responds to me according to my belief, how would I know it? How would I prove it? How would I use it? And will that lead me to a greater experience or a greater realization of God? And I think the last one I just answered because the answer is yes. Dr. Holmes tells us with all you're getting, you have to get God. See, sometimes people approach, approach a teaching such as this and they, and they think, well, you know, it's kind of like I figured, out how to, I figured out how to win at the slots every time I pull the handle. And that's their, that's their entry point. How do I use it? That's okay. But what I'm suggesting to you now is, is that the reason that we do this is it's practical, it's tangible, we can see results, but it leads us into a greater realization of God. That's our spiritual growth. So we begin by wiping the slate clean and saying, how do I know what I know? How do I know? What I, how do you know anything? And how would, you, how would you go about checking and testing and verifying all of these things that we are saying? It is done unto you according to your belief. So we can look at, at different teachings around the world. You know, we can say, well, in, in the Old Testament, in Judaism, it says, uh, <coughs> in the Proverbs, Proverbs 23, as, as, as you think and believe in your heart, so are you. Well, think, what is think? Most of us understand a thought. We may not know where they come from. <laughs> we may not know how we generate them, but nevertheless, we experience this thing that we call thinking. But what is believing, <clears throat> you see? And why does it say in our heart? Most of us think, well, thinking is a function of the brain. See, the brain is this organ that's contained in the, in the skull. But how does the heart think? See, how does the heart believe? What, what, are, what are we talking about here? What are we really saying here? So it takes, a, it takes time to, to just say, okay, well, we're told that. Think and believe in my heart. But it's different. It's a different thing than just thinking, you see. It's a different thing than just reading a book. What is it? In Buddhism, we are told that everything that we experience is a result of what we have thought. And that's, it's two, that's a two-fold um, statement there. It works in, in a couple of different levels. One is, is that you process whatever you experience in your thought. You kind of form an opinion of it. And the other is, is that thought is causative. If you, if you think or you read about the idea of karma, right, thoughts beliefs, emotions, actions. Everything that we do has a causative effect. Well, of course, yes it does. 
We believe that. We, we believe in what we are doing. Right? If somebody steals, why does somebody steal? Well, they think that's the way that they have to behave in order to get their good. Well, why do they think that they have to steal in order to get their good? Well, there's not enough good to go around, and the only way I'm going to get mine is to take somebody else's, you see. There's a belief in lack. There's a belief in limitation. And what would you expect someone who goes through life with a belief of lack and limitation, and I'm not getting mine unless I go out and take it? What is it what's going to happen? That's the life that they're going to experience. They're going to struggle for everything they have. It is done unto us according to our belief. And our concept of the divine, you see, is one of the, the deepest values that we hold. It is, those represent the deepest beliefs that we hold, and that's why it's important to come back every January and ask ourselves, what do we believe about that? If we think that God is mean and vindictive and punishing, if we believe that, then that's what we will experience. If we believe that the divine sends us sickness and trials and tribulations because somehow it needs to test us, like it doesn't know, it knows everything but it doesn't know, so it needs to test us, doesn't make any sense at all, does it? The divine needs to strengthen us. Does it know we're weak? Or does it only know us as it knows itself, you see? So we, we've grown up in a culture that has accepted the, the um, tribulations of life as being in divine order. That, well, well yeah, God had a different plan, so God sent, sent that to us to, uh, because God knows better, kind of, kind of an understanding. And what I'm saying is we want to go back and say, well, is, is that true? If the divine is all that there is, if it is spirit, which is, which is mental, which is thought, if it has created us out of itself as its individualized expression of life, then could it want for us anything it wouldn't want for itself? To put it another way, could it only want for us that which it wants for itself, for, for it knows us as part of itself. Would it punish itself? Would it test itself? Or would it love itself? If the divine is all that there is, and if the divine knows all, and if the divine has all, and we're going we're gonna to have to get to this idea of the divine knows all or not <laughs> next week. But if the divine is all, if the divine knows all, if the divine has all, if the divine can do anything, right? Omnipresence, all presence, omnipotence, all power, omniscience, all knowing. These, these are the attributes of the divine that many of the theologians would say, well, yes, you know, we don't know what the divine is, but it expresses itself through these things. Then we would have to say, well, why would it create in the first place? Right? That's another aspect of the divine that we have to consider. It is creative. <laughs> How do we know that? Well, we have creation. Dr. Holmes says, if there's an engine, there's an engineer. Somebody built it. We have creation, so we, we kind of surmise that there's a creator behind it. There is this unlimited energy which becomes form and matter and matter takes form and it expresses itself through form for a while and then that form goes back to energy but there's no more energy than there ever was there's no less energy than there ever was there's just energy taking shape taking form we have creation if the divine has created us out of itself, and we did not create ourselves, we are like the turtle on the fence post. <laughs> We're up here, but we know we didn't get there by ourselves. Right? We are here. The Buddhists tell us that the game was in progress when we got here, and we're just trying to figure it all out. We are here. We are alive. And this life must be some part of a bigger energy that is expressing itself in us, as us, and through us. And if the divine has created us out of itself to express its life in us, as us, and through us, we would say, why would it do that? And we don't know why. We're just, we're just supposing. You know? Why would it do that? But we can say, well, if it has everything it didn't do it out of need, 
it didn't do it out of lack. You know, when Mr. Carrier invented air conditioning, <laughs> there was a need. <laughs> it was hot in the summertime. See, cool air was a gift. The divine doesn't need anything. Why would it create? Why would it create you and I if it doesn't need anything? Why would it create it all if it doesn't need anything? And the best we can say is it must create out of joy, out of the desire to experience <laughs> its creation, to express as its creation, to love as its creation. So we take these ideas then that somehow we have been banished and doomed to suffer through the actions of Adam and Eve. We take that and say, well, that, maybe that's a story. Maybe that's a teaching story. Maybe that's an allegory. Maybe there's a deeper lesson in there. But the divine could not condemn us because it could not condemn itself. It could not punish us because it would be punishing a part of itself. And now our concept of the divine has to change, has to change. It's very subtle. The outpicturings are very subtle. See? We don't necessarily know what we believe, but we know what we experience. And if we take the premise it's done unto us according to a belief, then there's something like that man who didn't want to go to his sister-in-law's house. There's something within us that is somehow blocking the flow if we are not experiencing the fullness of life. And what we want to do is we want to become our own experiment. We want to become our own experimenters. And we want to say, if it is done unto me according to my belief, what is belief? What is the heart that I'm supposed to be thinking in? And how would I go about testing in order to see, is there a way for me to change my belief? Or am I just, I come into the world with a certain gene set and that predetermines everything and uh, therefore there's nothing I can do about it. So let's eat, drink, and be merry. The one thing that you and I can do that as far as we know, <laughs> no other creature can do is to be aware of our thoughts and change our thoughts. Change your thinking change your life next week in part three. And so it is.